Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this year's 2021 Missouri Reentry Conference. My name is Les Johnson, and I serve as the Vice President of Family and Support Community Initiatives at Arches. Arches is proud, again, to be a sponsor this year of the Missouri Reentry Conference. This year's conference theme is the lemon year. We were able to squeeze that lemon and make lemonade, and our discussion topics over the conference will include leadership, education, motivation, opportunity, and negotiation. We encourage all of you to please um, join us this morning by using your app. You can download the app for this year's conference at the App Store, Google Play, or on the web. All you have to simply do is go and search Arches Hosted Events or scan the QR code and you'll be able to join us on the app. The app, the app has a lot of cool features that you can use to connect with friends virtually, network with folks across the state and, and other countries and other states. So please join us on the app. Also, we'd like to remind you that we're very excited that this year's meeting app sponsor is the Missouri Coalition of Recovery Support Providers, Missouri's Recovery Lifeline. And so again, thank you to the Missouri Coalition of Recovery Support Providers. We appreciate your support and your sponsorship of the app. Also, as we are, this is so that all of you know, this is week one, day two. And our week one session sponsor is sponsored by none other than the Mission Gate Prison Ministry. And we really appreciate your sponsorship, the good folks at Mission Gate. We appreciate the reentry services that you're providing to the community, and we appreciate your overall support as it relates to understanding the true issues impacting Missouri's citizens who are returning to local communities and need the reentry support of all our providers are out there this morning. At this time, I have the uh, esteemed pleasure, and I find I'd really say pleasure, of being able to introduce you to um, the person that will be providing the morning's uh, welcoming remarks. Uh, the person that I'm about to introduce to you is a, I consider a true advocate for Missouri's children and families. He is none other than Bill Dent, the executive director of the Family and Community Trust. And we call that fact locally here in St. Louis and across the state. And they are also a proud sponsor of this year's Missouri Reentry Conference. Bill, Turning it over to you. Les, thank you very, very much. I am once again very pleased to be with everybody uh, again at this conference. And again, we are so happy to be uh, one of the co-hosts as we have done for getting close to two decades now. Um, as Les indicated, I am the executive director of an organization called the Family and Community Trust. We are situated in Jefferson City, but we have a statewide network of 20 organizations across the state and Arches is one of those. And I bring greetings from not only all 20 of those because they've been working in the reentry world for, for many, many years. Actually from, uh, from the very beginning that we got connected to it. Um, and so I'm very proud of the work that, that each of them does. Um, and our board is comprised, just to give you a, a little commercial break on it, our, our board is comprised of top leadership from state government. So cabinet level folks, and then leaders in uh, business and civic organizations across the state. So they come together four times a year with our community partnerships, and that's it's that sharing across uh, all of those sectors that makes our work uh, so impactful. Hey, I, I'm always impressed by the the themes that we ended up coming up with, and this year is is no less different for me. Lemon, and you know that phrase harkens back to um, to Dale Carnegie, actually a book that he wrote in 1945, where he wrote that. If life gives you lemons, you know, make lemonade. But I decided to do a little deeper dive into that. And I found out that it probably goes back a little bit earlier, probably to around 1915. And there was this, there was this man they, uh, by the name of Albert Hubbard, and they called him uh, an anarchist Christian. And he had a friend who was an actor, and his name was Marshall Pickney Wilder. And this young, this, this a friend of his died and Albert Hubbard was asked to write his obituary. And he referenced the fact that this friend of his, this friend Marshall fought back against so many odds 
and always had an optimistic attitude. And so he noted in the obituary, and I quote him here, he said, he picked up the lemons that fate gave him and he started a lemonade stand. So we know what that means. So he found the positive in the potentially negative things that surrounded him, that fate had, that fate had given him in his life. And then I began thinking about us and the pandemic and our conferences and how important it was to be together. And I, I, at those physically in those conferences and the pandemic forced us to think differently. And it's very similar to what we did. You know, we took the lemons that fate gave us and we turned that into a very positive thing and sometimes very unintended positive things. So the same is true of us. We have picked up the lemons of fate and we started our own lemonade stand. And with that, it, it, it created a huge challenge for us. But on the opposite side of that, it probably allowed us to engage partners that we wouldn't have been able to before. It expanded our outreach and allowed folks who may not have been able to attend in person for whatever reason, budget constraints or travel requirements or whatever, but it allowed them to, to enter this world of reentry that we have been working in for, for many, many years. And it's also created new methods and formats for all of us who work with the justice involved about how we do that work. And so it's kind of helped us rethink the work in the COVID environment. And I contend, I know from, from our own business practice, from the Family and Community Trust, we have incorporated things in our daily work, especially around our meetings, that we will probably continue to incorporate as we move forward. So we're going to take the best practices that, that we've learned from having to work in the COVID environment and, and, and take that forward into our work for a, for a much stronger and more positive organization. So on Tuesday, we kicked off the conference with the theme of, of leadership. And I wanna thank Director Presythe from Corrections for her opening remarks that kind of kick-started us. And the other thing I wanna say about that session that morning was Mr. Blackman, stress something that we talk about all the time and that in, in the context of leadership, and that is it's really about the relationships that we build and maintain that help create better leaders. And so these kind of, these kind of events, these conferences help bring us together, help build stronger relationships and thus build us into better leaders for the work. So I also wanna thank our co-hosts. You know, we, we could not do this work without them. And let me first start by saying behind the scenes in all of this, you know, Arches plays an enormous role, uh, not only in, in terms of planning and, and doing all of that, but they also convene a small team of folks who plan this conference every year. And they begin that planning as soon as the, co the current conference ends. And I wanna thank those folks. And that's a cross sector of folks, that's DSS and DOC and community organizations and, and representatives from, from my organization as well. But I also want to thank Jennifer Tidball, who has been a strong supporter of our work in reentry from DSS, from the Department of Social Services, and of course, uh, the folks at the Department of Corrections and Anne Presythe and, and her group. We could not do it without you. So today, the uh, second day, first week of our conference, we're kicking off the second letter of that lemon, and that is E for education. So it should be an exciting day. I'm looking very much forward to hearing the presentations by Miranda Gibson and Patrick Breyer, Marty Meyer, Donna King, and Cicely Riley. So thank you all for giving me a little bit of time on the agenda. I'm happy to be here again to help support the work and our community partnerships will continue to support the work of reentry across the state. So Les, I'm gonna kick it back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. I appreciate those remarks. We appreciate the good work that you do supporting Missouri's children and, children and families across the state of Missouri. Before we move into our first panel presentation, I'd like to take time if I can, and I know I can because I'm the host this morning, so I'll take <laughs> that liberty. Um, just looking and scrolling through at some of our attendees this morning. So we have folks from CWIT, Center for Women in Transition, NEMO, Workforce Development Board, Bridging Families and Bridging Communities, Transition for Change with the Urban League. We have folks from Mission Gate, um, Reset Missouri, St. Louis, Missouri, Dismas House, Impact Group. We've got folks coming in from other states. We've got representation from FACT, of course. We've got In from the Storm. 
Better Family Live. Good morning. Let's see, the Urban League. We've got folks from New Beginning Sanctuary. And so, as you can see, we've got folks from DOC, from the institutions participating, and the community correction staff across the state of Missouri. We have folks from universities and the local colleges attending. So you can see we have a good uh, representation from across the state of Missouri, from all facets, facets of folks who intersect with justice-evolved individuals trying to identify ways in which they can support these individuals as they return to local communities, using evidence-based and best practices, and sometimes simply trying to figure out what works best for their local communities to support individuals returning home. So at this time, I have the pleasure of introducing to you our first uh, set of panelists, starting with Miranda Gibson. She will be joined by Patrick Breyer. But I'd like to tell you a little bit about these folks so you know who's presenting. Miranda Gibson is the grant manager for MacArthur Safety and Justice Challenge grant. Miranda Gibson is the grant manager of that of the uh, MacArthur Safety Justice Challenge grant in St. Louis County, Missouri. She leads the team in their efforts to reduce the jail population and address racial and ethnic disparities in the criminal justice system through systems reforms. Ms. Gibson led collaborative efforts to launch the TAP In Center as part of the SJC work. She earned her MA in Criminology and Criminal Justice, BA in Psychology and a BS in Paralegal Studies from Southern Illinois University, Carbondale. Ms. Gibson will be joined by Patrick Breyer. Patrick is a retired Deputy District Defender, first assistant with the St. Louis County Trial Office. Patrick is a retired 33-year veteran of the Missouri State Public Defender System, where he served as the Deputy District, District Defender of the St. Louis Community of the St. Louis County Trial Office. In addition to his daily defender duties, Pat recently served as the founding legal coordinator of the community-based Tapped and Center Service Collaboration, which you will hear about shortly. Pat, uh, Patrick has also produced numerous articles and essays and podcasts, and they've appeared online on numerous platforms. His teaching materials on implicit bias and jury selection have been presented by the American Bar Association, NAPD, and the Southern Legal Clinic Conference and discussed on the BBC series, The Why Factor. In 2021, an article, in his article on systemic racism's impact on black, indigenous, and people of color in the jury summons process was published in the UCLA Criminal Law Justice Review. And so you can see we have some heavy hitters on our lineup this morning. So at this time, without further ado, I'd like to bring to you Miranda and Patrick, and they will lead us off this morning. Thank you. Thank you so much. And good morning, everybody. Um, I'll start uh, sharing my screen. All right. Does that look good, Pat? Yep. Okay. Looks good. Yeah. All right. So, oh, good morning, everybody. And so, we're excited to talk about um, a new initiative that we've launched in St. Louis County on um, the Tappan Center. Um, so, this was launched uh, a collaborative effort amongst uh, several agencies, which we'll talk about um, how that worked. And uh, uh, we, we're really excited to talk about this. It's new, it's part of our um, MacArthur Safety and Justice Challenge work and general community engagement work in the county. And we've been operating about a year now. And so we're excited to share it with you all today. Um, so just as a brief overview, and um, we'll talk more about the services uh, later in the, in the presentation, um, but essentially we're a community-based uh, legal service and we're situated in the Florissant Valley Library in St. Louis County. Um, that's a convenient, safe space for folks to go um, to seek help with legal matters, get social support services, and, and just kind of tap back in uh, into the um, legal, whatever legal case they're dealing with. And so we operate every Tuesday from 6 to 8 p.m. Um, folks are encouraged to come up to the library in person, um, but we, uh, we 
soon realized that we needed to implement a remote option as well. Um, so folks can call in, uh, email, text uh, with questions, and, and they're uh, able to do all of that remotely as well. And so uh, the Tablet Center kind of formed during COVID. Um, so many of you in the, you know, working in the legal, uh, criminal legal sector know um, some of the challenges that um, COVID brought to us. Um, one thing that we were really concerned about was the, um, the coming uh, issuing of warrants that were gonna happen um, when this COVID hit and, and courts were kind of closed down, a lot of confusion. And we were concerned that this would be a perfect storm um, along with traditional barriers that people faced um, to be able to uh, you know, continue on their court case successfully. Uh, so lots of things, you know, imagine being <clears throat> uh, a defendant and having to deal with, you know, work conflicts, child care, um, trying to get to court. If you're unfamiliar with St. Louis County, um, our county seat is in Clayton. And so a lot of folks, you know, it's a long way to travel. If you don't have a, have a car, it's not easily accessible, no free parking. Um, it's very difficult to get to. And, and then, of course, we have, you know, the common cases where people move so they don't get notification of their court dates, uh, which happens a lot. Uh, people don't get them. They're unaware that they even have this court date. And so warrants are issued uh, whenever they don't appear. And then again, some people are just afraid to go to court. If they know they have several warrants, um, they're afraid to go into a courthouse building and fear of getting arrested for those warrants. And then of course, just being a, a lay person and being unaware of the legal process. They don't know what a warrant is. They don't know the consequences of not coming to court. Um, they're unsure if, they're, if they have an attorney, if they also have to come to court. Uh, so just a lot of those things have always existed. I'm sure a lot of your jurisdictions deal with that as well. And then with COVID hit, it just really amped all of those things up and more. Um, Pat, if you wanna talk about your experience as a public defender um, with clients dealing with these things as well. Yeah, thank you, Miranda. Uh, a lot of what we want to talk about today it was uh, well introduced by Bill and Les, and especially uh, something that Bill said really hit me is how COVID brought about how we change our relationships uh, between different organizations, community groups, uh, community advocates, community activists, and, and how we rethink those relationships. And, and the challenges that we saw with our clients uh, forced us to rethink those, in, those connections, those relationships, and how we were doing everything uh, between these individual groups. So what we saw was COVID, COVID was amplifying the traditional problems presented by systemic racism, institutional racism, uh, institutional barriers across the board, uh, and so we realized quickly that we had to rethink things. And, um, and that's why Miranda and, and Beth Eubner at UMSL who were some of the people who coordinated the grant, and brought it here and were the innovative forces behind the grant were really a part of getting all the parties, all the organizations, all the government entities to start thinking differently. So we saw those challenges that Miranda just spoke about. And, and some of the biggest challenges was we saw as public defenders that how our clients were being impacted by COVID. That traditionally they were not tech savvy. You know, traditionally they did, and they weren't tech savvy because of, of problems you know, with them. It was because you know, they had never had the resources. Uh, to be able to access a smartphone because they didn't have the money to buy a smartphone. So when it came to judges starting to kind of gear up the system, judges were ready, like we can't just, you know, we can't just stop, we have to start the process. And a lot of clients were not ready or prepared to be able to zoom in or WebEx in. Um, and what we found is public defenders and lawyers, we were very how to, how to kind of transition to this new technology. And it took the courts a little bit and our organizations, prosecutors and public defenders to kind of figure it all out. And then clients lag behind that because of these barriers, the, the digital divide that presented. 
um, for uh, many, many of our uh, clients throughout the region. And you know, then lawyers were, were, were facilitators trying to make sure that clients were getting into court, getting into court virtually. You know, I remember having to explain the details of how you log in. I'm not a tech savvy person. And I would be the last person to try to explain to someone how to engage Zoom, and how to get involved in the court system through that technology. Uh, but we were forced to do that and we did the best we can. Then what we also thought about is if public defender clients and public defenders and people who are represented by attorneys are having this much trouble engaging and connecting with the court system, then those people who are not represented and there are a lot of them who engage the court who don't have attorneys, you know, what are they going to do? Are they suffering in silence, wanting to connect, wanting to take care of these problems that are festering in their lives, these legal problems? And, and but they don't have the resources. They don't have a lawyer to call. Uh, they're kind of out there on their own. So th that's how the challenge really presented. And, and that's what forced all the organizations involved in the Tappan Center, uh, like Bill said, to start rethinking how we do things and how we interact and how we can reach out to put uh, clients and what we in Tappan Center call participants call and put our participants first. Thanks, Brandon. As I'm trying to tackle this, um, this new issue um, that was just being amplified from, uh, you know, failure to appear issues we were already seeing. And like Pat said, all the organizations had to figure out how we were going to, to handle this and how to do things differently. Because clearly the traditional means of, of appearing and just having folks figure it out wasn't going to work and it wasn't working. Um, and so we came together, um, the MacArthur Safety Justice Challenge, Public Defenders, the Bail Project um, at first to um, just kind of talk about the issue. And we started with just, you know, talking about amnesty days or, or just some kind of uh, mechanism to, to help folks, to reach folks um, who were confused by the process, didn't know how to access the courts and, um, and would likely get uh, into a failure to appear situation and then be in bad standing with the court, potentially get arrested and then come to the jail. And so we really wanted to uh, re-engage these folks, encourage them to, uh, to come back in uh, for these criminal cases without fear of arrest. Um, that was our primary concern because that was already identified as such a, a barrier that folks had, had to come in uh, if they had a warrant to come into the court, even to just resolve something like a court date. Um, They're very fearful to do that. So we wanted to make that um, as, as easy and as safe as possible. And also talk about identifying reasons for why they didn't attend. Um, so often, you know, we see um, they just fail to appear, but we never know why, you know, when we look at someone's case. And so we were really interested in identifying why that was. And what we found, and we'll talk about soon, it's, it's rarely that they were fleeing, right? It was always some kind of barrier. Um, sometimes they just forgot, um, which is fair. Um, and, uh, and so we just wanted to really be able to, to help those people connect back with the court and keep their case moving, get them uh, re-engaged. And we also wanted to help this uh, burn on the system that we were seeing. So as part of the MacArthur Safety and Justice Challenge, we work with all the partners in St. Louis County that are part of the criminal justice system. And we could clearly see the COVID was gonna impact, of course, you know, the jail, the courts, uh, all of our attorneys that are working, probation and parole. And so we really wanted to focus on, you know, how to help them as well. And how could this program that we wanted to create um, help them move along their cases and expedite their case processing, um, get some of those cases moving, and then also reduce the need for law enforcement to have to go execute these warrants for people that were missing court. Um, and then again, uh, reducing the jail population by preventing them from coming there in the first place. If we could get them re-engaged and get them a new court date. Um, so those are really key um, in how we wanted to, to go about forming this program. Like I said, whenever we uh, <clears throat> first thought about this, it was really um, myself, Dr. Huebner from OMSL, uh, as we're, we lead the Safety and Justice Challenge, uh, the Public Defender's Office in St. Louis County, and then the Bail Project. And, and we were able to, to get the prosecuting attorney on board 
and and they were have been really supportive of our program and they're available every week and and they are integral to the success of this. Um, they see the importance of it. And I think we were able to convey that and get them on board um, to then get the courts on board. And so our judges are supportive of the program as well. Uh, but it was, it was a really interesting uh, time again, thinking about how to do things different, right? And typically, you know, not all of these um, government agencies, you know, universities, nonprofits, um, advocacy groups will work together, right? Uh, and so, so bringing them together was a really uh, just necessary thing to do. And, and it was, I think, been really helpful to how we're able to reach so many people and get so much done um, because we've been able to make these connections. Um, across the board, we had already made some of these with our MacArthur work, and so just really bolstering them with this program um, was great. Um, Pat, do you want to say anything more on the partnerships? Yeah. Uh, thanks. Uh, you know, if you look at the, if you really kind of take a, a look at these different organizations, traditionally pre-COVID, you, you kind of can say to yourself, you know, these all are organizations uh, take on soul and the safety and justice challenge out of it, but the rest left on the board were kind of designed for a culture of being, um, you know, suspect of the other organizations. There's a little bit of, let's be cautious working with them. Uh, you know, let's, you know, this is an adversarial relationship. And by law, you know, the process, the public defender and the prosecutor's office of, of kind of a, a law established adversarial process is in play to dictate the interaction between the two. The bail project, you, know, you don't consider typically being uh, you know, collaborators with the prosecutor's office or the public defender, you don't think traditionally with the, the folks in uh, the jail system. Even though we have quite a bit over the years started to evolve and work with these organizations, but this was, this was kind of you know, coming together uh, of all that. You know, uh, Bill and Les talked about leadership in the context of relationships. And what was so incredible is that the leadership of these organizations put aside that, that adversarial relationship when they saw that we need an effort to go forward to rethink how we do things. And the incredible leadership of all these organizations, whether they be activists and strong community activists out of the bail project to you know, politicians who have to run for office out of the prosecutor's office, uh, to you know, public defenders who fight for their clients every day, um, and, and DJS officers who, who work hard to try to serve the residents of DJS. You know, bringing all those together was really a, testament to the leadership in all of the organizations. And, and Miranda and Beth Hubner and Humsel and the folks at MacArthur, uh, they all helped that happen. And, and this, you know, it, I just think back to what Bill said, that this slide kind of reminds me about that leadership and how leadership changed and altered and rethought how we're going to help participants as we go forward. And we can't forget the library. <laughs> I would be remiss. <laughs> and I'll let uh, Miranda take it from there. But the library was you. Yeah, so uh, speaking of leadership, uh, the leadership of the library, we had never worked with them previously to this project. And um, I, I had a connection through a connection, you know, that worked in the executive team of the library and uh, for the St. Louis County Library. And I gave him a call and pitched this like, you know, a idea that we didn't have even formed yet, um, but we were kind of looking for a, a home for this idea. And we knew that we didn't want it to be, you know, in the courthouse, because that was our, uh, one of the barriers that we, we know the folks deal with. And so we wanted to be in the community, wanted to be accessible, um, free to enter, you know, a safe place for folks to go. Um, and so the library seemed like an obvious solution to, to our partners. And so we reached out to the library and they were extremely accommodating from the start. Um, and so, so working with this uh, leadership team was just incredible. And um, they were so you know, eager to say yes and really wanted to, to work with us. And libraries, especially you know, St. Louis County, I'll brag about them um, certainly, uh, have become almost like social workers, um, especially during the pandemic. 
And so, and they really saw that the library was kind of an extension of, you know, government assistance, like they could really provide um, meals, diapers, um, they're doing all kinds of things, um, iPads and laptops for kids doing Zoom school. And, and so they really uh, saw the need um, for these kind of community supports. And so this was just another thing that they thought they just, they like this is something they needed to do for their community. And they were um, incredibly on board and receptive to that. And, uh, and Kristen Sorth, the, um, the director of the library, always talks about how the library, the, her um, St. Louis County Library, they wanna say yes and figure it out, as opposed to saying, no, like we need more time or, you know, they really wanna say yes and then just figure it out for the things that they care about. And so that again with leadership, um, was so important and so refreshing for us. And, um, and they've just been great. <clears throat> it was a, a just a, a definitely a new way to do things um, for the, all these agencies to work with such a non-government agency um, to do this kind of work has been incredible. And um, the two concepts, and as we go through these slides, we're gonna talk about higher leadership principles and higher principles of change. Uh, that we found emerged from the from uh, putting the tap in center together, and two of those are introduced here. And, and Kristen with the library really uh, came and, and provided those concepts: uh, the idea of getting to yes and modeling that for the rest of the collaborators. It's like uh, the library. Kristen was there. Look, I, she goes. I can get that person on the phone if we're having a problem here. I have that person on speed dial and I can make that happen or I can get you this. And then the concept of the library wanting to do better as a community partner. And they admitted, we want to do better. We want, our people want to do better, uh, you know, in the wake of our, in, in the aftermath of, of COVID and what evolved with, with George Floyd and, and the reckoning the revolution that evolved from there and the rethinking that people had uh, based on what happened over 2020, you know, everyone needed to rethink and the library said, we want to bring, we want to get to yes, and we want to make sure that we are changing the way we think of restorative practices, restoring justice back into communities. And those were higher concepts that were first introduced by the library and pushed us going forward. Uh, and I couldn't say enough about Kristen's leadership. I'll let Pat, if you wanna talk about uh, our community was, zone. Yes, uh, so it was important to, to emerge with a new concept too. So we had to start thinking about how we do things differently. Of course, the library wanted to be involved, but. You know, we could have easily just reverted back to, okay, why don't we use this, the Clayton, uh, you know, uh, library uh, or, you know, headquarters and, and do that. But we were thinking, you know, we need to get out of Clayton. We need to get out of urban, you know, these downtown areas, remove from downtown, re remove from Clayton. We need to get back into residential areas, into communities, into under, into traditionally underserved communities where, where populations, marginalized populations have traditionally uh, lived. And we need to get to where people are that we have, we can help and serve. Uh, so we took it out of Clayton, we moved to the Ferguson Florissant branch of the St. Louis County Library. We wanted to make sure we had evening hours, free parking uh, located uh, in North County where we found, you know, where this was evidence-based, you know, where Miranda and Bess were able to pinpoint where were the areas that we need to locate, what was the evidence-based practice where we need to locate the tapping center. Um, casual, non-intimidating environment, no security checkpoints, and, and free transportation if people needed help. Um, you know, and we just had to remove these traditional barriers that that individuals face when they approach a facility like the Justice Center or the Courthouse in Clayton or downtown. Uh, so we tried to eliminate that and we wanted to start building trust in the community. And a little later, we'll talk about how clients were a little nervous to start, but you know, we it's not easy, you just can't say, okay, 
We're going to build a safe zone. Everybody, we're safe. It, it's a building this relationship with the community and, and that slow process of developing. Right. And so uh, so we had kind of our, our space figured out and and we knew uh, what we wanted, we knew what we wanted to do. And so we really focused on what is our, our primary objective was going to be war and recalls, or so we thought, um, within St. Louis County's uh, felony charges. And, uh, and we really wanted this to be a place for people to go if they had active warrants, if they weren't sure if they had warrants or not. Um, where we could, you know, verify yes or no and tell them, you know, what those cases were about. If they had general legal questions um, that they could come in um, for any of those types of things. So our, our main service uh, continues to be warrant recall. Um, we started out, like I said, with St. Louis County um, felony or misdemeanor warrants, those state issued warrants, because we had uh, Wesley Bell, um, our, our prosecutor, um, and his team on board. So we knew that we could get those accomplished um, because he dedicated a staff person to be available every Tuesday from six to eight to us. So the way this would work, someone would come in, um, a client would come in, check in with me, I might get their information, find their case. Um, and then the attorneys, um, Pat or another defense attorney, I'm um, either a public defender or volunteer attorneys, um, would look into their case, you know, find what's going on, talk to the client, see what the issue was as to why they didn't come to court or couldn't make it to court. And then that defense attorney would call whoever the prosecutor was who was available remotely, talk about the case and the prosecutor would consent or not to uh, recalling that warrant. And then our attorneys would do all the paperwork, file that motion with the judge, <clears throat> and then that warrant would be lifted. And if the person would be given a new court date, kind of a second chance court date um, to re-engage with the court. And uh, so that continues to be about 90% of clients that come in um, seeking that kind of service. And, and it's really been just amazing to see the relief that people come in. A lot of them, you know, they know they miss court, but they're afraid to come back. And they're afraid of being arrested. They're afraid of, you know, what would happen if they tried to deal with it themselves. And it's, it's pretty complicated to deal with it themselves if you aren't familiar with the system either. You know, we get people come in that say, you know, oh, I had no idea who to call. I tried to call this person, it wouldn't work. I tried to get into Zoom and they wouldn't let me in. Um, my phone died during court and I, you know, I, I hadn't had my turn yet. So, uh, so it's been a, a real relief to see. I mean, really eye-opening too to the, to the partners to see like, oh, these are so many valid reasons um, why people aren't able to miss court and or why people aren't able to attend court. And so, um, so we're able to do that, get the new court date and help them in, in other ways, which we'll talk about. Um, I'll pat if you want to talk about the uh, ways that we've been able to expand. Yeah, on the first day that we opened on the Tappan Center, uh, and I'm sorry if my microphone is not reaching out as best, I'll try to talk a little louder and I did turn up my microphone some. Uh, but uh, what we went on the first day of the Tappan Center, a, a mother came in and said, um, okay, so I, my son is confined in a penitentiary in the state of Maine, and uh, I need help with getting his warrant taken care of in St. Louis County so he doesn't have a warrant out for him while he does his time in the state of Maine. And I go, oh my gosh, if it's, you know, this is not going to be traditional problems that present. Um, so we, we were put on notice from that very first day that this was going to be a, a challenge and that we had to start, we had to make a decision early on that, you know, were we going to embrace the higher concept of, are we going to be participant driven? Uh, you know, are we going to look to the needs of the individuals that come into the center? Or are we going to be structured as an organization say, no, we don't do that type of thing. We do this type of thing, we don't do that type of thing. So we realized as we re-looked at how we do things, we had to be driven by and directed by the participants themselves and their needs. And that, you know, that's included traditional stuff that we were ready to do, apply for a public defender, uh, you know, learn about criminal cases, uh, seek assistance with virtual court. Um, you know, we knew that. 
we knew that's what we would be doing in addition to warrants. But also then it started to emerge. We would have to help people re-engage with probation and parole. Uh, people were having housing and eviction issues. So we were able to seek out an attorney who could help with those issues and, and give advice. And they were able to come on and connect uh, with individuals who came in. Um, we, were, we had some low cost volunteer attorneys who said, yeah, we'll handle cases for very low cost uh, for people who don't maybe don't qualify for a public defender. We had people reach out about expungements and, and we were tempted to say, well, we don't do that, but we had people who were helping who, would a, who were able to actually facilitate that. And, um, and we were able through the process to make connections with organizations uh, in Kansas City at UMKC, who does a lot of expungement work and is working on trying to put networks together throughout the state who said, heck yeah, how can we help? Um, DMH, people at DMH were, were very helpful in giving us information. We even were able to connect somebody who was on a conditional release and had monitoring issues. And we were able to connect them with an attorney who actually did that kind of work and did it free for them. So we, we had to seek out we had to kind of say, uh, you know, we had to say, look, uh, we, we're going to be participant driven and we're going to not say no to anyone. We're going to do our best. We can't help everyone, but we're going to do our best with whatever problem they have. Uh, Miranda, is this the time for my joke? Is this a good time to? <laughs> <Okay. laughs> so on the coldest day of the year, while we're with the library and everybody, we moved into the vestibule of the library. It was windy, it was cold. We're all wrapped up in coats so we could be COVID safe. The vaccine wasn't out yet. And you know we're, we're all trying to do what we can. And the first person who comes in in the dead of winter is a person who was very angry, very upset. They needed help. And they wanted to sue their travel agent because their travel agent had um, you know, canceled their trip to Florida, and they were very upset about that type of thing. Uh, so we, you know, we could have very easily said, no, we don't do that, sorry. Uh, you know, but in a way, we had to, we had to do that in a nice way, and we had to do it with the person leaving, feeling like they found resources, resources that could assist them. If they, if they were someone who needed help, and they believed that they you know, had that need, then we were going to give them resources that might be able to help. We couldn't help them ourselves, but um, it was always about getting to yes with each person that walked through the door. Absolutely, and part of that, that we were even able to do that is because of the wide uh, collaboration that we've had from so many partners. Uh, and so that's been a huge benefit um, that we didn't see. You know, whenever we include so many agencies, we just found out through, you know, working with these folks that we have so many connections. And so, you know, whatever someone comes in for, someone in our, you know, network of partners or allies knows someone that can help usually. Um, so that's been just an added, you know, benefit of this, this um, very collaborative uh, multi-agency experience. I mean, what, what was important to us too, in particular to the bail project, um, who was our, one of our primary partners, is to provide not only the legal assistance and the warrant recall, um, but to provide a holistic advocacy with these wraparound services. Um, the bail projects model is, if any of you aren't familiar with them, um, is released with community support. And they really believe, um, as do we, that you know, you're much more likely to succeed um, once you're uh, in dealing with the criminal case if you have support in all of your other areas, right? So, so they really want to assist with, you know, if you have housing needs, transportation, if you need meal vouchers, clothing assistance. Um, they even had, they were able to create these big like cleaning supplies and PPE care packages for folks to come in um, and uh, all kinds of connections. And they were able to, leisure, to uh, lever their relationships and connections with community agencies around mental health, substance abuse, and all of those um, types of things that people, you know, might have a hard time finding themselves, or it's overwhelming to find themselves. And so, so folks would come in, talk with their attorneys, and while the attorney is doing their thing, um, they would talk to the bail project advocate who is there and do a little bit of a needs assessment, see what they 
see what they needed and try to help them and connect them as much as they could. But those short-term things like housing, meal vouchers, and then some long-term support as well. Um, and try to get them into programs um, or any other support services they need. Um, and so that has been a real added benefit um, to what we've been able to do as well. Uh, Pat, do you want to talk about the, uh, the regions? So, yeah. So when we um, started trying to withdraw warrants, uh, what we found is with all the municipalities in St. Louis County, I know every organization here has that challenge when they, when you think about what their clients and participants go through, all the, all the different uh, government entities, including the 90 something municipalities in St. Louis County. So when people started walking in through the door, we realized that one of the biggest needs was that they had municipal forms. And we couldn't very well say, okay, we'll take care of your St. Louis County warrant, but we can't really take care of the five warrants you have throughout St. Louis County. We had to find a way to help people with their municipal warrants. And then we started having people come in with their city warrants. And then many, many people started when they heard about the Tappan Center started coming in with their St. Charles County warrants. And we, we then realized there was this connection between North St. Louis County and St. Charles County and, and that individuals, there was not this border thing that stopped individuals. You know, they're, they're, people were fluid throughout the region. So we had to think regionally and we had to stop thinking like we're St. Louis County people or we're St. Charles people or we're cities. So we were able to get attorneys on board, public defenders, even private attorneys who could help us. The bail project was fantastic under the leadership of Mike Milton uh, with bringing in attorneys who could help with the municipalities. They were able to provide some funding uh, to, to get that started. And, and that has been a game changer. Just the fact that I'm sure all of you in, in the region and even outside of the St. Louis region who are here know about the issues that confront with all the municipalities in St. Louis County. And we had to kind of take that on and not be, you know, not use that as, we couldn't just say no, we had to take it on. And we brought resources together to try to help people with those types of wards. Uh, so the network, uh, of public defenders also throughout the state was really also able to help us outside of the St. Louis region, which I think is our next slide. Yep, here we go. Okay, so, you know, then people started coming in from, you know, I have a warrant in Cole County, I have a warrant out in Springfield, or as far south as Jasper County. Uh, the network of public defenders throughout the state were just like everybody else we talked to and reached out to. It was like, how can we help? The deputy district defender in Greene County uh, was like, oh my gosh, how can I help? I will help this client, a St. Louis person living in St. Louis, but they have warrants out of Greene County. I will help. And the warrant got recalled like in the next day. Uh, same thing, just uh, district defenders, management of the public defender throughout the state just embraced the idea and it was like, and each one reached out, how could we help? Um, and so St. Charles played a big part. They provided an attorney and they still do have an attorney in St. Louis City uh, full time who's there remotely to help us with uh, warrants throughout the state and throughout the St. Louis region. Right, and so, so we've been operating since uh, September 22nd of last year. Um, so we just passed kind of our year mark. And again, we operate every Tuesday um, for the two hours. And so far we've served uh, now over 260 clients and recalled over 220 warrants. And so that's across felony, misdemeanor and uh, municipal ordinance violations. Um, mostly munis and mostly St. Louis County. But like Pat said, we have had people you know, they, they do, they live around St. Louis, but they might have things in other counties or, or of course, you know, a lot of people have things in both the city and the county, St. Charles County and St. Louis County, et cetera. Um, so as we've been able to recall uh, over 220 of those, and it's all free to the client and um, we don't charge them anything to do this service. Um, it's just like all the partners have agreed to kind of provide a staff person 
Um, and that's really the only cost that we incur. Um, and, you know, is, is that staff cost that the library hosts us for free. Um, so we don't charge clients anything um, to do that. Uh, and also importantly, some folks, you know, they come in and for a number of reasons, sometimes the, uh, the prosecutor cannot consent to the warrant recall for you know, a variety of reasons. Um, but even when that happens, um, they still, we're still able to usually um, do something, you know, whether it's just inform them about the case, um, get them to apply for a public defender, if they don't think if they're working um, and won't qualify for a public defender, uh, you know, some will be able to connect them with a the lower cost attorney um, and any other holistic kind of wraparound services the bail project can assist with. So even if a warrant's not recalled, it's not necessarily our only goal. We really want to expedite the case and just keep it moving as best as we can um, and then help that person just be successful and um, be able to resolve you know, any other uh, matters that they might have coming in. Hey, Miranda, how, how bad would you get at me if I asked you to go back to a previous slide? No problem. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> how about the MCU slide and the uh, helping and seeking help from Alice? Would that be too difficult? I'm so sorry. <laughs> It would be too difficult. I think it hit. Oh, that's right. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I apologize. Uh, I'll kind of refer to what I was talking to, and I wanted to kind of say something with that slide. But um, getting there were higher principles. There were higher principles that we started thinking about um, as we emerged uh, into, you know, as we started developing the tap in center. Um, and some of those uh, guiding principles were you know, the concept of getting to yes that we talked about. And so getting to yes, uh, the library taught us about uh, how we were going to make sure that participants heard the word yes and other collaborators were able to get the word or were able to uh, hear yes when we wanted, when they wanted to collaborate. Am I on the right side, Mary? Yeah, sorry, be um that slide isn't in this presentation. There we go. There we okay, go. cool. Uh, sorry about that. I'm I'm throwing you all for a loop. So, <laughs> so the idea of getting to yes and oh, hold on. Okay. And then also the idea of being participant directed, like we talked about before, as how the participant uh, was able to kind of lead. Uh, you know, what the services were and what we were providing. And we had to also think about the client holistically and, and the advocacy for that individual participant. We, we couldn't just think about uh, the individual having a warrant and then doing the warrant and then leaving. We had to think about their needs, their housing needs, their food needs, where they were gonna even sleep tonight. Um, so, you know, we needed to, uh, their transportation, uh, we even gave them cleaning supplies as they left and COVID su safety supplies that would help them. So we had to start thinking ab about each client uh, holistically, we had to let them direct us for the services, and we also had to make sure that we got to yes when we listened to them and our partners. And we also had to get to yes when we were talking with our other organizations like uh, MCU, uh, probation and parole. So we could start providing a resource to the community and we wanted to be a resource to other organizations uh, like MCU when they reached out and said, hey, do you wanna do an expungement claim? Um, could you help us with that? We were able to get to yes with that and they've provided us with incredible services MCU is just a marvelous organization. Probation and parole, how can we help you and can you help us when we need it? Um, and then even College Church at St. Louis University, uh, they reached out to us and said, you know, maybe can you find us an attorney who maybe could do this and this one little thing could help us immensely. And we were able to make that connection. So we're, we are also a community connector, trying to put individuals together trying to get, build those relationships and build that leadership style where we're putting individuals together. And so, um, 
the emerging themes that kind of came out of the Tappan Center where we, it's not like we sat down and said, all right, we're going to take these higher principles that, that are talked about in the activist community and in the community advocacy community, and we're going to apply them and open a Tappan Center. No, we, we kind of were clueless and then became educated by our participants, by other organizations, uh, by our member partners, by new partners who kept coming in. I don't think anyone ever said no. So what we started learning was, and Mike taught, Mike Milton with Fail Project taught us about community-led innovation. That, you know, we want this not dictating from the top down, but let the community kind of uh, let it evolve and let the community talk about what their needs are and following that path. A uh, safe zone for success. You know, we the prosecutor's office actually modeled this, that that they were, they their leadership style was so strong and so effective that they realized them having a physical presence there could be a deterrent for individuals coming in. So the principle of a safe zone for collaborators to get together and talk about issues, but also a safe zone for them to succeed, uh, you know, for clients to come in uh, was important. Uh, also participatory defense, getting to the idea that participants needed uh, to take a part, an active part in their own uh, case and getting them educated about what they need to do. And then finally, all the partners started talking about restoring justice back into communities that have been underserved and, and, and restoring and redefining what restorative justice is all about. So these principles emerged from the Tappan Center and, and we try to keep them and be and motivate and try to keep them going as of today. Um, so that is all that we have. Um, uh, thank you so much for letting us share um, our presentation with you and talk about the Tappan Center. Um, we're really proud of it. And uh, I know we have a couple of questions uh, in the Q&A, uh, if I can start going over that. Um, Someone asked if there is any income uh, restrictions for people who seek help at tap in. Um, not at all. Anyone can come in. Um, we don't need anything. Just, you know, they tell us their name, date of birth, and we find their case. And, and that's about it. So we don't have any uh, restrictions uh, with that. So anyone's welcome um, to come in. And then uh, would any of these services possibly be available for incarcerated persons? Um, so we have had a couple, um, Pat, if you want to talk about it, people that um, their family member or their attorney had reached out um, for their um, loved one or, or their client who was in prison somewhere else and they had St. Louis County warrants. Yeah, uh, there, there is. I, I talked about that first client that came in. We've had a lot of family members reach out uh, with people who are confined in other jurisdictions. We haven't had that many people from the Department of Corrections in Missouri reach out uh, with family members yet. It's usually been folks in other states or in the federal system uh, who have state uh, have St. Louis County warrants that we've been able to help with. Uh, but I think that's worth a conversation. If we try to put something together on a bigger scale, then we're gonna need to have these, have more leadership and conversations and relationship building to help put that together. But no, we're, sky's the limit where we can go. Um, another one, um, did gang territories affect the location that you chose? Um, clients sometimes tell me it's difficult to access some services because of crossing territories. Um, for I don't think that I, we haven't heard that as an issue um, personally um, the, for people that have come in, right? But I don't think you've had any issues either clients feeling un, unsafe. No, and, and I have not. I have not heard that, but that is something that if, if anyone you know, does know or hears about that, we would like to know that and try to accommodate that and, and factor that in. Absolutely. Uh, uh, why was it important to meet in a location without security checkpoints? Uh, I think that, it, I think when people, it, it's, it's when people have warrants, when people are, you know, they, and making the decision that it's time to, to make a change, to get 
things taken care of. Family members are encouraging them. They're fearful, they're scared, they're distrustful of the system. So we need to remove the barriers that, that have prevented them from doing that, from changing their lives. And, and so I think it was important to remove security barriers so people would feel that they, they could walk into a library and seek some help and get some advice and figure out if this could get done without the threat of arrest or incarceration. And I think a security barrier, as important as they can be, and we've learned that you know, we can't live without that at times, uh, but I think it's also important that we provide opportunities for clients who might be turned away by, by that, that image um, or that situation. And so we were able to kind of make that happen in the library, was able to provide, you know, just enough uh, security, just enough without a presence, you know, behind the scenes, just a resource person more or less there, non-uniform, non-armed, just there if we needed any help. The library helped us get there, and they were a strong advocate, like libraries are not going to be turned into armed camps. And they were like, no, we just cannot do that. So, and nobody wanted that. So that's, that's, hopefully that answers the question. It's a very tough question, but yeah, I hope that answers it. Yeah, it was definitely a discussion a couple of times with, amongst all of our partners. And so our solution was to have um, their security manager present every week. And so he's a, he's a former law enforcement officer, um, retired, um, and he's trained in um, you know, de-escalation and, and all those things that he doesn't carry. Um, he's just always there um, with us in case anything would go wrong. We've not had any issues whatsoever so far. And, and the police have been very understanding too. They, they understand that, you know, it's, it's a really cool area. It's on a park, it's a nice parking lot. The police love to have their dinner and lunch there and just sit and, you know, it was a good place for them to patrol and watch the, the road. But they were really receptive when, when it was like, you know, could you maybe during these periods, you know, not be so evident or present so people don't feel turned off. They've been, they were phenomenal also. The, the individual officers were very responsive. Right. Um, a couple more. Um, where is the resource in Greene County located? Um, so we actually don't have a physical location. Our physical location is just the Florist and Valley, um, one in St. Louis County. Um, what we were able to do with the Greene County situation was someone came in, they live in St. Louis County, um, but they had a, a case in Greene County. So Pat was able to um, reach out to the Greene County Public Defender and uh, and make that connection that way. So we were able to help them totally remotely. Yeah, but you know, one thing I think that Maria, myself and Miranda would like to emphasize, if we don't have a monopoly or a patent on this, if no. people want to collaborate and start putting something together in any county and other, any area, you know, we're there to help give advice and help you get together with different individuals to make it happen in your jurisdiction. Um, you know, in, in any location, even in like places like St. Louis City, St. Charles, kind of working on those issues. So the leaders here, we challenge every leader here to think about bringing a tap-in center closer to you. Right. Yeah, we just hope this can be somewhat of a guide or a framework or whatever works in your jurisdiction. We we would love for everyone to replicate it. Um, and like Pat said, our emails are here. We're happy to help um, with anything like that. Um, Someone asked if agencies need to call you before sending a client. Um, nope, not at all. Um, some people do. Um, we get a lot of referrals from Justice Services. And so people, like their case managers, will email me to let me know that someone's coming in and a little bit of detail about their situation, but totally not necessary. No, we, we don't need appointments or anything. Uh, people just come in. They might have to wait a little bit. Um, if it's you know right at six, there's a few people. But um, yeah, anyone can come in. No appointments are needed. Um, the Miranda and Patrick, uh, we want to thank you again for your presentation. As I was listening to your presentation and um, the way you've constructed this, um, this model, it, it reminded me of an old saying that politics makes for strange bedfellows. And in, in this instance, I believe that collaboration for, we can say that collaboration for justice involved individuals makes for strange bedfellows indeed. But you indeed have figured out a way to make it help, make it work. So again, on behalf of the communities that you're supporting, on behalf of the justice involved individuals across our region, we say thank you and we appreciate your support and your presentation this morning. Thank you so much. Happy to, happy to be a part of it.
All right. At this time, I'm out of coffee, you all. So it's time for our break. We will break for 10 minutes and then we will uh, conclude with our uh, presentation at the second half following our break.
Did we all get the background? Donna, how you do the background? Uh, we, uh, I was wondering that we get a that we all get a copy of the the lemon background. I think we all uh, it, it should have been in an yes. email. It was in your packet uh, that Tiffany gave us. Yeah, it was there. Mm, I'm thinking about wearing flannel on Thursday less. <laughs> It'll pop with this background. <laughs> Yeah, I saw your remarks there. <laughs> well, yeah, you just disappeared all of a sudden. Then I, no, like, I saw it too. It was kind of weird. It's kind of ghostly, right? Yeah, <laughs> I don't think your weird. computer. Yeah. I, I don't think your computer camera likes the lighting in your office. Like an orb or something, right? <laughs> <laughs> the haunting of the. Because uh, <laughs> you know we're in the Fox Building, so this place is probably haunted. The Humboldt Building. Oh, I've actually I've heard that before. Yeah. So yeah, they do ghost tours and all that stuff. So. Well, good morning. Good morning. Morning, Mr. Jason. Miss Cicely. Good morning. Can you see me? Yep. Yes, we can see you. Jason, I'm waiting on that email. I'm not sure if you sent it or not, but if you haven't, that discussion we had with the information. Yes. He just sent it to me. Got it. Okay. I just want to make sure I didn't drop the ball. Yep. Nah. nah. It's always good to say someone else dropped the ball. It's not me. <laughs> Every once in a while that happens. So <laughs> I tend to drop it or nine then, but hey, I, I understand. Yeah. Hello, Mr. Dumas. Yes, how are you? Doing great. How about yourself, sir? Everything's fantastic. Everything's All right. Fantastic. A little cold outside, but kind of hey. caught me off guard, but hey. I can't do anything about the weather. I knew it was coming. <laughs> Just roll with it. <laughs> Hello, Donna. Oh, how are you? <laughs> Good. Long time no see. I Bye. know. I think I've accumulated a few more gray hairs since last time. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everyone. It looks like we're ready to get started. Looks, looks like we're back from break. Uh, I don't have my coffee with me because I had to make my own, so it's not ready yet. So it looks like I'm going to miss out there. However, you won't need any coffee for our, our next presenters. They're going to keep you up. Uh, we will go right into our regional update panel, and I will introduce um, your primary uh, presenters, and then they've also brought some guests with them as well to help co-facilitate their presentations. So this morning, I'd like to introduce you. We're going to start with Miss um, Cicely Riley. She is the District Administrator for Missouri Probation and Parole. Miss Riley began her career with the Missouri Probation and Parole in 2001 as correctional service trainee. She was promoted to unit supervisor at the Kansas City Community Release Center in 2006. Ms. Riley also has experience in facility, institutional and community facility and community treatment contracts. She was promoted to district administrator in, East, in Eastern Jackson in 2016, where the focus is based on case management and expanding the reentry services in the area. Next, You'll see on your screen, Ms. Donna A. King, and she wouldn't uh, forgive me if I had left out the A in, in Donna A. King as I introduce her. Donna, Ms. King is the Regional Administrator for the Eastern Region, Missouri Department of Corrections Division of Probation and Parole. Donna earned both her bachelor's and master's degrees in criminal justice administration from Central Missouri State and Lindenwood University. She has over 30 years of experience with the Missouri Department of Corrections and Community Corrections. She began her career as a probation and parole officer in St. Louis City and has held several managerial positions from unit supervisor, district administrator, associate superintendent to now regional administrator, responsible for districts, district offices in both St. Louis City and County and the Institutional Parole Office at MECC. Donna currently serves as the co-chair of the St. Louis Alliance for Reentry 
and she's also an Arches board member. So thank you, uh, Donna, for your support. And hopefully you voted this year to keep me on board as an, off, as an Arches employee. Now, last but not least, we will trans, uh, transition to Mr. Marty Meyer. He's a suave and debonair guy that you see with the red tie. Marty is the reentry coordinator for the Missouri Department of Corrections. Marty holds a bachelor's of arts in psychology from Truman State University. Marty has worked in public service since 2009 as a corrections officer at the Boone County Sheriff's Department, Division of Youth Services. Two for the Missouri Department of Social Services, Division of Youth Services, a probation and parole officer, including working closely with the 13th Judicial Circuit in Boone County before entering his role as reentry coordinator in 2019. Marty is very passionate about working to make a difference and strongly believes in improving lives for a safer community. So at this time, I will turn it over to our panelists and they will move forward with their presentations. All right, and I believe that I'm first off on this one. All right, so thank you very much for having me. My name is Marty Meyer, and as Les introduced, I'm a reentry coordinator at the uh, Department of Corrections Central Office. And today I would like to uh, advise everyone on what we have going on uh, in the reentry unit that's sort of been new this past year, whenever we've been um, sort of experiencing uh, Zoom uh, and its entirety, as everybody's gotten to know the system very well. Um, and Les, uh, pink tie today, uh, going for the October uh, awareness. Um, so I uh, thank you for that. Um, and so uh, first off, uh, reentry, great unit to be in. Um, but one of the biggest changes um, is that the reentry unit and educational services, um, we've joined together uh, under the Division of Offender Rehabilitative Services. So if you're used to any of our acronyms in DOC, that's DOORS. Um, and so this partnership was really established to help build the bridge between, you know, classification team members and working on those case plans. Um, also, so we can really help bridge that gap between employers, uh, job placements for the clients, uh, really working on collaborative efforts uh, between employee employability skills, uh, soft skills, um, really ensuring that there's not going to be any duplication of services. Uh, allows us more contact with career and tech uh, individuals uh, that really work on that programming and planning for those um, and establish those new vocational programs and work towards um, implementing um, really uh, programs that the state will need um, as we continue to uh, progress into the future. Um, and we continue to build certifications and credentials for those offenders as we engage with those employers and really learn about what those employers need uh, in the ever-changing employment market. Um, and everybody sort of knows what's going on in the past year. There's been a lot of change. And so it's really important whenever we go to speak with employers um, to sort of learn about those changes because a lot has changed in the past year. And so if we don't figure out what's changed and, and sort of adapt to that, we're gonna sort of slow down and get left in the dust. So that's what makes me really excited about this uh, you know, collaboration and effort. We're gonna be able to do a lot of great things. And so um, how the reentry unit's set up, um, we have three coordinators uh, and an AO, so Administrative Office Support Assistant. Um, we have a to be determined individual who's gonna be working on a Western region um, you know, what they're going to do is they're going to look at all services and support resources in a Western region and be able to make that their specialty. Uh, in the past, uh, it was all coordinators sort of helped with numerous different tasks and, and projects, and we all had, you know, all of our hands in the same um, projects and planning, whereas uh, this is going to allow us to focus on that Western region um, that individual can. Uh, Heather and Cullen, uh, she is a, another reentry coordinator in my unit. She's going to be able to focus on uh, the Eastern region resources and, and be able to really uh, get to know and make connections and collaborations with them. Um, so that's going to be really important. And, and my function um, is, is going to be really to uh, focus on those employment needs, uh, work with employers, find out what they need, find out um, you know, the outlooks and work with our career and tech folks and find out where we can collaborate uh, really well. Um, both the reentry and education vocational focus, but what we try to do is make the best use of the offender's time while incarcerated. So when they return to our communities, they're going to be good neighbors, they're going to be good employees for those 
uh, employers in their catchment areas. They're going to be good parents. Um, they're, they're just going to be the type of individuals that we wanted to be whenever they release back to the community. Um, and so uh, by offering them educational opportunities, uh, they're going to be able to obtain their high set uh, and also vocational programming mm -hmm. and even higher educational opportunities. And by doing that, the offender is going to be a lot more likely to be successful when they're released into the community. Um, we really want to ensure that they're able to use their newly obtained educational skills and those certifications. So the rancher unit really helps to fill in those gaps by creating these opportunities for the offenders while incarcerated um, and really helping to provide those resources um, and those needs to the offenders. Um, there's a saying that I really like to keep in mind um, where determination and opportunity meet, there's going to be success. And uh, I'm going to throw a shout out to Ken Chapman because that's where I really first heard that. Um, but really, uh, we have a lot of determined individuals that really are looking for that opportunity. And without those opportunities, they're not going to be able to find those opportunities for success. And so that's why the Range Tree Unit works so hard and so close with education to provide those opportunities for our individuals. So what are some of our duties here in this reentry unit? Well, uh, some of what we do is we help develop, uh, we help implement some programming. Uh, we help oversee some departmental strategic initiatives and process improvements and be a support for team members. So that sounds like a really lot of great stuff, but whenever you're thinking, what does that really mean? Well, that really means, you know, whenever we're focusing on what does the ORAS mean whenever we're working on case plans? Um, what does it mean whenever uh, we're working with community partners and the types of information that we should be sharing with them or that we need to be sharing with them, but we don't currently? Um, how do we uh, program track um, the programs that we do work with with our community partners? How do we know what's working? How do we know um, what's working really well? How do we know what might not be working so well and maybe just needing a little tweak here and there? Um, so that's some of that oversight. Um, you know, we, we do rancher and release planning services as well. Um, we're working to uh, implement reentry centers and oversee reentry centers. Um, and also looking into things like, uh, you know, how we can get institutional peer support services into our facilities. Um, you know, also, um, you know, like to take a look at our institutional programs and, and what we can add um, and, and how we make them better. And we also want to bring in, um, you know, trauma-informed care because we understand that that is such a big part of, you know, an individual's journey and recovery is just having that trauma-informed care piece. And so uh, some more of our duties is, um, you know, we help offenders obtain source documents um, prior to their release from incarceration. So what are source documents? Um, we work to uh, get them birth certificates both in and out of state. And even if they're not born in the United States, we work to get them consulate uh, birth certificates. Um, we work to get them their social security cards um, and even identification cards in the form of non-driver's license IDs. Uh, we work to uh, get uh, driver's license reinstatements when possible and, and, and also uh, help get information on what may be holding up an individual's driver's license reinstatement so they have that information and can make a plan uh, so they can get that back before they get released. So they're not just you know, hit with all this information right as they go. Uh, we also work to, you know, connect them with uh, community-based resources like uh, applications for Medicaid before they get released so they can obtain that resource and, and reduce that gap in between release and obtaining that resource. And we do the same with social security benefits and also disability benefits. So we work really hard to connect with resources that an individual will need to help them become and, and, and provide opportunities to be those really good uh, community members that we want them to be. One second here, sorry. And so more duties that we have is um, we also engage with many community partners and state agencies. Many of you are on the, the call right now. And, and so we establish these partnerships to provide services for the offenders before and after release that address their criminogenic needs. This can be anything from housing, working with housing providers, um, MoCRISP um, and other housing providers across the state, uh, working with behavioral health, um, you know, working with organizations that provide education about soft skills and life skills, um, working with programs that offer cognitive behavioral programs and, and other pre and post release programs, um, programs that provide job training and, and job training that, that leads to things like apprenticeships and leads to things like on-the-job training and, and you know, job placement programs. 
uh, working with higher education programs to, you know, several examples of some of the things that we're working with, um, you know, workforce development boards, um, you know, going to speak with uh, economic development boards, um, working with Department of Revenue for those non-drivers IDs, um, working with social services, mental health, um, working with, uh, you know, social services so we can uh, obtain food stamps and SNAP for individuals before they get released so they have that resource. Um, you know, working with job training like Tremco we have out in a, uh, in a facility that works on weatherproofing and roofing and training individuals to do that so they have that skill whenever they're released. Um, you know, we work with Concordance Academy and Washington University, um, not only for, you know, trainings and, and, you know, soft skills, life skills, but also cognitive behavior programs and, and, and other higher educational opportunities. And so um, what do we do whenever we, uh, you know, other things we do, uh, we also oversee victims programming and restorative justice. Um, so that's really a, <laughs> one of the things that's close to my heart because uh, that's uh, one of the things that I do as well in mine. Um, so victim impact, it's, uh, we have a new program called Victim Impact Listen and Learn, which we recently transitioned to. And uh, this program, it's uh, really intended to assist the offender to develop an awareness of the impact of crime on the victims and the victim's family and the community that they came from and really develop a respect for those uh, and the rights of the others in that community and really help foster an accountability for those, their actions. Because when an offender is able to realize the ripple effect of their actions, they can commit to change their behavior to ensure that no more harm is done and no more victims are created. And it's a very empowering feeling, um, you know, whenever individuals are able to go through that programming. Um, you know, it's really amazing to speak with individuals after they've gone through that program from somebody that may not even care about anybody else or has that perception that they don't to whenever they get done with that, can identify what they've done to the community, how they've harmed the community, and show remorse that they don't want to do that again and come up with a plan of how they're not going to do that again. So it's really amazing to be able to see, and it's amazing to be part of being uh, a, a small part to provide that program. Uh, another program we provide is restorative justice programs. Um, Restorative justice holds the offenders accountable, uh, provides a means for them to repay their debt to the victim and the community, uh, provides an offender an opportunity to leave the system with an improved attitude and sense of belonging, as well as strengthening the social bonds that serve as the foundation of their communities. So many of uh, individuals have heard of the restorative justice program, um, have heard uh, we have a quilting program that's getting a lot of attention down in the south southern part of Missouri right now in Licking. Um, they provide a lot of uh, quilts to um, children in foster care. Uh, we have many, many facilities around the state that provide many uh, terrific uh, items and, and other services to uh, many uh, different community partners and, and even many uh, different citizens of the state. Uh, and that provides the offenders an opportunity to give back without receiving anything in return. And so uh, it just helps foster that attitude and understanding that social bond that they're more than just themselves and what they can get for themselves, rather what they can provide for their community. And so um, again, part of my job is to engage employers. Um, so we engage employers, we always work with them um, to either encourage or facilitate the process to help them hire justice involved individuals. Uh, currently we have a network of over 360 employers that are willing to hire our clients and that number is continuing to grow, uh, which is a great thing. And so in this current job market, we're really taking advantage of that um, to help uh, really uh, encourage as many employers as we can to consider our justice involved individuals uh, because whenever it comes down to it, justice involved individuals are individuals as well. Um, we work to have resource fairs. We just recently had a resource fair at Ozark Correctional Center um, last week and it went really great. Um, we also worked at job fairs and we're uh, hoping to uh, create a job fair in the near future uh, in the community. So watch out for that. Uh, that's a great thing that we're working on. Um, like I said, we are constantly engaging in chamber of commerce meetings. Uh, I was just at one yesterday afternoon. Um, this is one of the parts of my job I love. We get to tour job sites. Um, I love going to the different types of manufacturing facilities, the different types of just any job site in general figuring out what types of jobs these uh, sites are needing, um, what types of descriptions and skills that they need, and then being able to bring this back and let um, our different probation parole offices know 
uh, let our institutions know, just so we can figure out what types of skills that we can provide for our uh, clients and offenders before their release, um, so they have uh, better opportunities whenever they get released for employment in the communities. Um, we also like to do um, something a little bit out of the ordinary. Um, sometimes we like to take employers into prison. Um, whenever I go talk to chambers of commerce, I like to ask uh, individuals what their thoughts are for um, whenever somebody goes to prison. And a lot of times there's a lot of stigma and there's a lot of misthought. And so some employers, if they're sort of on the fence, they see the benefit, but they don't really know they're not quite there. We like to bring them into prison to show them what our career and tech folks actually do. And sometimes it's very eye-opening because it's a lot more than what they believe um, before they really got to see it hands-on. Um, we also like to try to facilitate pre-release job interviews whenever we have um, companies uh, that will work with us to um, work pre-release. Um, and we love doing that as much as possible. And we also build soft skills within uh, with the offender to really help prepare for release and, and really help uh, for that continued successful employment. So it's not just about getting a job, it's about helping the client get and maintain that job long-term. And so um, one other thing that many of you have heard about is our reentry centers. Um, we're really working to establish and implement those reentry centers in our facilities. Um, they're gonna serve as a hub for offender reentry and release planning. Uh, the concept focuses on engaging a level of cross-systems coordination among corrections, state agencies, workforce development agencies, reentry, social service agencies, and other key stakeholders. Um, really what this is, is we're going to be collaborating with these agencies in that reentry center to work with the offender population on reentry and release planning. Um, we're going to work with independent workstations. Uh, they're going to be equipped with limited and secure internet capabilities. So offenders will be able to gain access to services, resources, real-time employment data on a much broader scale than previously possible. Um, we're also gonna focus on four key service areas, which is gonna be education and employment, release and supportive services, case management, and family reunification. So a lot of really, really great things are happening. Um, started with um, many great things, but we've merged into doors as reentry, but it's really opened up a door um, for many great things to happen, which I'm really excited about. And so uh, that's all I have. Are we doing questions now, Les? No, we're gonna wait to the end, so yeah. All right, thanks. And I guess I'm, I'm up next. So, Good morning, everybody. Um, our session and our uh, presentation will mostly focus around on probation and parole and talking about uh, how we dealt with COVID and still engage with our clients and with our community partners as well. And um, anything new that we brought to the table or that we tried. Um, but I would like to say, uh, Marty and Heather, you're going to be busy in the evening because I wrote some things down. So we're going to do it. Um, one thing with the uh, region is that we we never stopped engaging with our clients during the COVID. Um, the DOC never shut down, but we did have to um, pivot and make some changes. So. We stopped, um, for a little while, we stopped the public from entering the building um, just for a little while until we could figure this, figure this out. And what we learned was we could, we got thrown into this remote world. And what we learned is that we could do it and we could do it well. It had always been something on our agenda with the department that we wanted to um, we wanted to do, we never really had that full support to move forward and make it happen un until the uh, Director Precise. So she came in and, and if you know Director Precise, when she puts her mind to something and she wants it done, she's going to get it. So one of the things that when she even came into the Department of Corrections, enhancing our technology was one of her goals for the entire department. So we're well on our way. I mean, we're light years ahead of where we ever thought we could be with working um, remotely. Um, 
we were really uneasy about what was going to happen, um, both professionally, professionally and personally. And so were our clients. I mean, this was something that we had never had to deal with in our lifetimes before. So um, just as we do, probation and parole, we, we stepped up to the plate and, and started those creative juices flowing. And um, what came out of that were clients or staff were meeting clients on parking lots. They were on front porches. They were setting up office uh, like drive throughs They would have the clients come up to the, they would open up the window to the office and have the client drive up to the window like a restaurant. Um, they were seeing clients like a pickup truck, picnic tables at the district offices, um, all sorts of things just to keep eyes on our, on our clients. They made, uh, staff took it upon themselves, took their own money. They made plexiglass dividers so that when we did come back into the office, there was the divider um, so that we could safely distance and, and, and keep the, the uh, momentum going with seeing the client. Um, we utilize our Zoom, Google Duo, um, whatever platform we could use to engage the clients. Um, although one of the barriers that happened with that technology was a lot of clients did not have the, the capability to really do a lot of um, Zooming or video conferencing because a lot of them were, you know, they could, they didn't even have the technology to, for the kids to be in school at that time. So we did not want to put one more um, barrier up for them with asking them to Zoom with us and utilize that technology. So that is when we're utilizing our, um, you know, the pickup trucks, the drive-throughs, the seeing them at, the, uh, at their jobs and on parking lots and at lunchtime and things like that. So COVID slowed us down, but it didn't stop us. It's usually nothing like that probation parole, that's for sure. Um, we also continued in the Eastern region to uh, showcase our community partners with our annual STAR Summit. We still have that. We did cancel in 2020, and right back in 2021, uh, and produced a virtual summit. Uh, thank you, Archer, for uh, making sure that that happened, because without their technology expertise, we would not have had it. Um, we conducted the summit in April and highlighted some of our new initiatives and, and old partners. We had the Criminal Justice Coordinator Council present, the Director of St. Louis City Children and Youth and uh, Families present, and uh, Chantel Fisher, the Soul Fisher Ministries. The, all those were our keynote speakers, in, in, along with some of our locals, um, like the Urban League and um, uh, Hers Goodwill, they were also part of that. Um, then we followed up with our monthly coffee chats, which were those quick hits um, that we were doing um, throughout the month. And one of our first coffee chats was the Tapping Center that you just heard this morning with Miranda and Patrick. Um, we had Dr. Lisa Yeager and Serena Blanks to do a presentation on occupational therapy. So um, this was part of our attempt to work together and keep the partnerships engaged and, and keep moving so that we didn't lose that, that momentum and that interest um, that was out there. And um, we were not gonna cancel again for the for a second year. So we did, um, we did our best at what we could do and, and bring some semblance, semblance of normalcy back. Um, our providers were still available to us. They didn't, not that I know of, they didn't shut down. They were still uh, in the trenches with us and working with our, client, with our clients. Um, I think that they had to take some time and step back and figure this out and, and pivot just like everybody else did. I know that they utilized a lot of technology um, that they're also still using today as, as well as we are 
in some cases. Um, one of our partners who I have on the line with me um, is Jason Watson from Mission St. Louis. And Mission St. Louis kept it going. They opened their doors up to us and also allowed us to come in to see clients there so that clients didn't have to go running all around. You know, we could, it could be a one-stop shop for, for our clients. And um, Jason is the Vice President of Workforce Development for Mission St. Louis. And I brought him in just as an a, uh, example of one of our partners. So I'd like for Jason to introduce himself and, and his organization and kind of talk about um, how they continue to work throughout this COVID issue. Absolutely. Um, thank you, Donna. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm sure like many of you who are on this call, like COVID was definitely difficult for us um, trying to transition. Um, a lot of things we did wrong on the front end, if I'm honest. Um, even just trying, um, although virtual was a pivot for us, what we realized was that relationships was really important when it came to servicing clients. So even though we were able to have virtual meetings, it, it removed that opportunity to really build the depth of relationship that uh, made our programming um, valuable. Um, but more importantly, like I, we began to really think from the mindset of the individuals that we're working with and they were in survival mode. And fear really means opportunity for individuals that are in survival mode. So it wasn't so much, even though there's a lot of people that don't wanna work, it wasn't that people didn't want to work, it's just that work meant making money. So if there was another opportunity to make money that was more viable than working, then those individuals would take that opportunity. And in a lot of cases, that meant them taking advantage of the system because they were trying to meet immediate needs. So we had to recognize that. And really, that's a valid mindset for somebody that's in survival mode. So we had to put ourselves in those shoes and say they're not thinking wrong, they're just thinking different, right? So that meant pivoting for us meant not doing any more virtual and trying our best to really build those relationships with individuals that we already had relationship with, which was really important for us. Number two was partnerships, right? So working with probation and parole and really opening our doors to make it easy for processing because when people are fearful, any barriers is anything that takes any longer amount of time. So we wanted to create easier processing so that people could be streamlined directly into our programming without having to jump through a bunch of hoops and a bunch of red tape in order to make that happen. So we started doing weekly um, enrollments where people could just walk in and probation and parole could just send individuals. So that way they wouldn't have to worry about, I need to set a time, I need to have a meeting and it just remove some of those communication barriers. Number two is just streamlining the opportunity. So making sure that the relationships that we have with employers would mean immediate um, opportunities for interviews, right? So rather than taking people through a whole bunch of processes, again, want to create that connection as quickly as possible. And then um, number three was trying to meet needs, meet immediate needs for individuals so that we can continue to build upon those relationships. Individuals really didn't care about programming as much. They cared about opportunity. Right, so they didn't just want information, they wanted opportunity. So we wanted to pivot in those ways. Of course, a lot of us did essential drives, things like that to meet some of those immediate needs that was really important. Um, also having partnerships with SLU so that they could meet some of the legal barriers that existed for some of the clients. Things like um, being able to drive back and forth to work without having to worry about your driver's license and if you had a warrant. You know, those things are bigger barriers when you're already thinking about other things. And then last for us was just understanding that health for individuals, really to think about your health is a luxury, right? So people that we were working with, it wasn't so much that they were concerned about being sick from COVID as it was the impact of COVID having on the opportunities that they could take advantage of. Because for most of them, health, they didn't have a health insurance, right? When you get sick, you go to the emergency room. You know, um, so really thinking about, well, if, if my kids can't go to school, that means that I don't have anyone to take care of my children. So that now means I can't go to work. So we had to think about other ways to assist them in those ways, whether it was transportation, whether it was connections to opportunities where they could get that assistance with their children. So really, again, meeting those immediate needs to connect them to opportunity was huge for us. <laughs> Yeah, I think that we can echo the same thing for the uh, Western region as to what Donna has um, spoke about. Um, 
specifically in the Western region, we did all of those wonderful creative things that you know allowed us to meet the needs of the clients here. Um, however, we also took some things a step forward. We had some districts within our region that actually facilitated community resource fairs in the parking lots. So you had anyone there from community uh, reentry programs as far as employment, life skills. If you know you had a mom that needs to sign up for WIC or food stamps or something like that, uh, we met that need. More importantly, we tried to meet the mental health need as well of the clients because you know the atmosphere of COVID did bring a lot of depression, brought you know some suffrage around. So we also want to make sure we met that need. I think what the beautiful thing about that, those community so, uh, resource fairs was that the officers were active in the parking lots with the clients. So they were guiding the clients, encouraging the clients and supporting the clients with whatever need they had. We were there to make sure that it was being satisfied. We also offered lunch for the families, you know, whatever needs you have for those for that day, and parole did assist in did assist with the community resources to, in order to have that need fulfilled for that moment um, and we're continuing to do that as well um, we were also able to meet with clients now in the treatment providers uh, offices so we're not fully 100 back in the office because the officers are required to maintain their contacts in the community so we also do that as well we meet with the clients in the treatment provider so if you have you know, a session that you're going to, you're going to make sure that we meet with your client there at your treatment provider. Uh, Gary Dumas was very intricate and Lincoln and very forward thinking, I might add, very forward thinking on how he can keep in contact with a lot of our clients. So I'll introduce you, Mr. Dumas, and your company. Sure. Well, my name is Gary Dumas, and um, I'm the founder of the Dumas Company Personal Development. And we've been established now for probably about six or seven years. And of course, prior to that, my background is at Swope Hospital as a full-time clinician there. But at any rate, uh, when we started the Dumas Company, I was actually pretty excited about it because one of the unique things that uh, we, we are able to serve, and that's the particular client that has the mindset of wanting to kind of go to the next level for a choice of words, which is why I love serving clients from the Department of Corrections in particular, because most of those are clients that have had their own businesses. Um, they've already proven to be successful um, in certain areas alongside of whatever challenges they may have been faced with that led to their incarceration. Um, a lot of those clients are very intelligent. And so a lot of them has already completed the therapeutic communities uh, for several times and several opportunities during their incarceration. And so being able to come out and although they were still under supervision and even still getting caught with a positive UA, if I might add, uh, they were wanting to be a part of something that could meet them where they are and fulfill a need that yet could inspire them to regain the momentum and just take their situation forward. And so the Dumas Company has been fortunate to be able to come in and meet that need. I don't necessarily want to describe it as a niche type of client that we serve, but there are individuals that are more a better fit for the type of programming that we offer. Um, probably about four years ago, you know, I was thinking as always on just kind of how we can use our influence because that's one of the biggest uh, pillars of, of uh, that we like to, you know, uh, support is how can we use our influence in a way to inspire clients to be better. And so at that particular moment, um, I was already doing a lot of workshops for the city of Kansas City, as well as a lot of other companies and different things. And so I said, you know what, let me integrate some of the uh, processes that I facilitate or some of the processes that I use in some of the other situations and just in integrate that into the services to the clients from the Department of Corrections. And that's how I came up with the idea for the Zoom. Obviously, Zoom has been out for many, many years, but during that time, uh, it was an idea uh, that I thought was pretty innovative uh, to introduce to the clients as another opportunity to implement and facilitate services. And so upon doing that, um, I found out that one of the concerns was, you know what, it's, it's through Zoom, you know, Doom is your strength has always been to connect with clients in person, of which I'm very grateful for. However, uh, upon the clients being able to engage in an opportunity, uh, they found it to be a pretty a pretty good situation. A lot of them were already working full time. 
um, and, and as well as not having transportation, even though they were having full-time jobs, but a lot of it was a transportation issue or not. For some, it's not a, because of barrier to transportation. Some of it is even considered a fringe benefit to be able to attend class from at home. They're in fairly good standing with their officer. They just had the positive UA, but still needed to complete some form of, of treatment. And so we're able to slide in that particular area and it worked out perfectly. I have what I created called the desire to achieve. And the desire to achieve piece is something that I thought would be a good fit as, um, as a intake tool, I guess, if you will, or part of my intake process. And out of the desire to achieve, of which there are nine, and I won't go through all nine, but I'll just share a couple to give you an idea. One is experience more fulfillment, raise your standards and set boundaries, get clarity on what it is that you want in life, and then there's several others. And so during the intake process, all of the clients at the time of enrollment would actually identify at least four out of those nine, and some would even identify all nine as some areas that they want to achieve during their opportunity to be a part of the Dumas company. And so I would actually, I've actually built my content and my curricula around the, their uh, identification of the desires to achieve. That way we're able to meet them where they are. We're still able to identify the information or, or continued education necessary regarding their positive UA. Uh, we of course include the addictive personality behavior disorder content. We include what I now call the emotional fitness piece, which is kind of an extended newer version or remix, depending on how you want to look at it, if you will, of the anger management piece. So we're able to infuse all of that content inside of Dumas Company programming and deliver through the vehicle of Zoom. And it, it's, been, it's been fairly productive. In fact, um, since COVID, uh, our actual service to clients have actually increased uh, immensely. And so it's one thing for me to say that as a service provider, but for me at the end of the day, it's looking at the numbers and looking at the enrollment, as well as looking at the feedback from the clients themselves in order to determine whether or not what we're doing is working. And so gratefully, uh, Sisley's district in particular, District 24, the officers there uh, have been very instrumental in their referrals and very, very actively involved. And even to the point of using uh, some of the service providers' locations as satellite meeting places or offices, if you will, for some of the officers. I actually have officers in my other offices now <laughs> that are meeting clients here as well. So um, but the Zoom piece has been working uh, very, very well um, to, to, a lot of them, to a lot of their surprise. They've been able to find out for their own experiences that uh, engaging with this company through the Zoom piece has been just as effective uh, as meeting with me in person during the time, which has been several years now, that I've actually held conventional classes, if you will, in, um, in our particular location. So is this the part where we do questions and answers? <laughs> Yes, if you guys have finished with your formal presentation, uh, it, it's, it is that time for us to move forward with Q&A. So let's see what we have in the Q&A at this time. One, one question that came up is about uh, what advice would you give to uh, new probation and parole uh, employees coming in uh, where the environment now is shaped by COVID. So you're doing difference a little, a business a little differently. So what advice would you give to those newbies coming on, those neophytes? Um, I think that with us, um, you know, they have to compare it to. So <laughs> it would be business as usual for them. So I think that, and the officers that are coming in now are usually straight out of college or is someone that has been in the, um, in the case management field that's making a transition just over to probation and parole. So I think that they've already gotten um, used to if they're transitioning over to probation and parole. So how that remote works or telework happens and then for those new out of uh, college, 
they're used to remote and, and zooming and, you know, technology is their world anyway. So it's, it really hasn't been hard for those clients or those staff that are coming into um, probation and parole in the Eastern region for sure. Okay, great. What about finding or establishing a peer support services for individuals that uh, are in need of that type of support as they're trying to navigate and maneuver uh, once they're in the community? Is there a listing out there? Is there an opportunity to contact your local probation parole officers? Do we contact Marty? How, how do we move forward with identifying peer support uh, networks for justice involved individuals? So I think it is an opportunity to have that discussion with your probation parole officer. Um, I know here um, we do have a lot of clients that have made great changes in their life. And if they're even if they're still on supervision, they've still been able to navigate through the system, so to speak, in a positive manner. Um, speaking specifically for the resource fair that we had, we had, I believe, a total of like six clients that were out here just mingling along the parking lot, being a peer support and providing that guidance and those resources to our current clients that are not maybe not as successful as they are along the process. Um, so that is one thing they can do. They definitely should have a, con a conversation with their probation parole officer. Marty, do you guys have anything? Mm -hmm. It's been a year with this and I've still forgotten to unmute myself. So um, Cicely, that's great information. And, and I uh, know that there's some areas which uh, are really great um, with having the peer supports very in the community and visible. Um, there's other places where it might be more rural and it might be a little bit harder to identify which organizations have those just because of the distance between um, where the resources are available at. Um, and so, uh, there's a, a couple of different options that we can look into. We can have communications with some. Um, so I would definitely start with a probation and parole office. Uh, they always have the opportunity of connecting with um, the reentry unit and we can then communicate with like the credentialing board. And um, you know, somebody just advised that there's a peer coalition in Missouri that we can always speak with. And so we can work with um, you know, the more uh, 30,000 uh, foot versus the regional pieces to try to identify which um, you know, organizations may be in which areas that do offer peer support. So if the regional pieces can't identify, then we can sort of filter up and try to identify that way. So we can work as a, as a collaborative piece here. This next question looks like it's uh, back to you, Marty. Um, you mentioned a program that favor favorable outcomes about mental health. What was the name of that program to you? Was there a specific um, program or was there a, a model that you were referencing at the time? Oh, I forget what I was talking about whenever we were talking about that. Um, there was cognitive behavioral therapies. Um, you know, we, we work with a lot of different mental health providers across the state. And so uh, as far as I, you know, know and believe in just my experience as a probation parole officer, whenever we address that mental health piece, especially the co-occurring piece, um, that is going to end up supporting our clients being a lot more successful in the long run, no matter what. So just paying attention to that mental health piece and just acknowledging it uh, is going to be an opportunity to build that success. Um, so I don't believe there's just any one program that's going to be a lot more successful than another. I think that's going to start really at that grassroots between either uh, the community partner and the individual or the probation officer and the individual, just having that and acknowledging that need and piece right there and how it plays in with everything else, whether it be substance use, whether it be housing, whether it be employment, uh, it, it can play a piece in all of those and, and be unknown how just until it's identified, um, just getting it out and talking about and, you know, erasing that stigma, which may, um, the individual may feel that is there. Um, that's a really big, important piece of that, how it can become so much more successful. Great. Thanks, Marty. What advice, and this is open to all, all of you, uh, would you give for someone interested in starting their own reentry program? Or, or, or is that even an option at this time? Uh, is the field overcrowded in terms of the number of entry programs out there? You need more collaboration or you need more providers? What's your take on it? Um, Wes, I would say uh, collaborate, 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 uh, and find out what you want to do, uh, you know, as the end goal, and search out others who may be doing that in your area. So that way there's not going to be, you know, two entities doing the same thing. And find out if there is another entity, what they're doing and what they're doing well and what they may need assistance doing because that person or that individual, that entity may be able to assist the other organization. And that way they're not doing double the energy to create the same outcome. 
And so I would say beginning with understanding what you want the end goal to be and identify others in that field and collaborate and, and just ask them how they got there. Uh, and, and they can provide a lot of insights. So just collaborating with other community partners. They won't bite, you know, that's the reason why they do what they do is they wanna help and, and they're really great people. What say you Donna in Sicily? What's your take on that question? Either Donna, Donna or Cicely, okay. either one of you. Well, you agree with Marty or? It's funny that you should mention that because um, Jason and I were just talking about that, about you know collaboration and, and trying to get something together outside of just and, and Mission St. Louis, but bring in some other providers that we can um, put together and try to come up with something even more creative and beneficial for, for our clients. One of the things that those in the Eastern region can do is join STAR, which is our reentry group um, in the Eastern region. What was the name of that again, Don? It's STAR, St. Louis Alliance for Reentry. Oh, thank you. And Les and I co-chair that, and um, Jason actually is on our steering committee. So I think that that would be a great start for those that are in the East to come aboard and work with us that way and talk to those partners that we have sitting around the table because, you know, we don't have all the answers. If we did, we, we definitely wouldn't be still working. So if we could all come together that way, um, I think that would be great. And that would be a great start. And Marty and um, Heather, if you all are interested in, in sitting next, taking your place at the table, we will welcome you as well. We're always here. Um, I guess I could add to that thought a little bit less. Um, sure. One of the things that I would say is just knowing your target population. Just spend a lot of time, you know, walking with people, talking with individuals. Uh, I think number two would be just be innovative. That was one of the conversations that me and Donna was talking about. Like it's, you know, in order for what we do to work, we have to think differently than how we, how we have done things. So the good thing about starting something is you get the opportunity not to recreate what already exists. So it doesn't have to look like a process that's already been done. And then number three, I would always say funding, like, you know, look for, look for individual funding. Nobody's gonna talk about that problem, but that is a real problem. Um, try your best to strengthen individual funding so that, so that the way that you do your work isn't dictated outside of how you want to do that particular work. And those are the three things that come to mind for me. Les, you're muted. Okay, now anyone else have anything to add to that conversation or that question? Contribute to it? I was actually thinking the same thoughts that Jason uh, had shared, um, you know, just to keep it simple. Yeah, a lot of times I realized that uh, people coming with the idea of wanting to uh, recreate ideas that have already been established and they're a little uncomfortable about bringing their own unique creativity to a situation. And so even though it's already been shared, but I echo that um, if, if not just, you know, want, want that to be reinforced more than anything, just to put it plain, don't be afraid to be you, <laughs> you know, bring you to the situation and I know with me, my motto has always been quality over quantity. Uh, there may not be a whole lot of clients that I can see, but at least the ones that I do see, they're able to, they're a good fit, what we're offering. I know a couple of different occasions, uh, there was a gentleman, uh, one from the NBA, and then another couple of gentlemen from the National Football League, that they were all on uh, probation and parole. And, but yet they were a good fit because Again, they had already been exposed to a certain type of programming. And so uh, the Dumas company was in position to actually serve these individuals. And now I'm not saying that those are the only type uh, with those type of, uh, with that type of background or experience, but I am saying it to say, had I not been in position, could it be that they may not have gotten their needs met based off of what they had already been exposed to in such a way that can challenge them where they are yet inspire them to a whole new level. So don't be afraid to be you. It, it, you, you can't deter, base it off of how many people you can serve. Um, if you can just focus on those few amounts that uh, would be a good fit for what you offer, 
then as far as I'm concerned, that's a win. All right. One final question look, looks like we have here is how do we involve, uh, provide a safe way of involving justice involved individuals in the planning and implementation of programming? I know Jason has always been an advocate of, <laughs> on that side of it. Unmute yourself there, Jason. I'll unmute. Yeah, definitely a, definitely a soapbox. Um, I think that a lot of, I think that your program should be dictated by the individuals that you serve. I think one of the ways that you do that is making yourself available. The reality is we make ourselves available for what we want to. And um, when you sit down with individuals and just have real conversations with them, you find out what needs they have, you find out what are their real concerns. So a couple of the things that we've done is even when we've thought about crafting our programming, we allow them to speak into it. You know, uh, whether that's the processes, how do you feel about when people engage you, right? What does that make you feel like? You know, um, what should the DNA of the culture of our building feel like when you come in it? Like what makes you feel comfortable? You know, um, you know, I grew up in a lot of controlled chaos. A lot of individuals are used to controlled chaos. You know what I mean? Actually, they uncomfortable in too, too much of a structured environment. You know what I'm saying? So when you start to talk to individuals, I think that helps you kind of lay a pathway for what your programming should really, really look like. I think also through experience, I think holding your programming with an open hand is really, really important as well. Like as you kind of grow as an organization, growing providing those particular services, you know, some things we can hold very tightly to. And um, what you learn about your clients is that they're, they're forever changing. They're always in changeable situations. So holding the way that you think and the way that you engage them with an open hand um, plays a huge role, like in allowing them to be able to speak into how you actually service them. So a lot of it comes not just from conversation, but from watching how they interact and adjusting you know, some of what we do, I always say that our programming should bend to people and people shouldn't have to bend to program, right? So we wanna create programming that's fluid enough for different people to navigate through because everybody is different. And you only find that out by engaging individuals in conversations and building relationships. All right. Well, and, and that, it looks like, let's see, I'm just checking the Q&A again. It looks like we answered all of the questions um, that have been posed. So again, uh, thank you to our esteemed panelists, Mr. Gary Dumas, Marty Meyer, Jason Watson, Donna King, and Cicely Riley. Thanks again, and we appreciate the information you provided us today. Hopefully, uh, we know that you guys are accessible. And so all of our uh, attendees, all 192, almost 200 attendees, uh, have an opportunity to reach out to you and contact you if they need more information. Uh, we'll make sure that we have your contact information made available to them.